will go ahead and start with the presentations. And as I said earlier, um, Heidi Luckenbach is sick and is unable to join us. So I'll be go going through her presentation tonight, which is the integrated water plan, um, and specifically talking about the water shortages uh, for Soquel Creek and the city of Santa Cruz, and the collaborative efforts on the desalination program. This illustration, can everybody see or should I move? Can you see it? This illustration just geographically shows uh, the boundaries of both of our service areas. The city of Santa Cruz and Soquel Creek Water District are adjacent at 41st Avenue, and together we serve about 135,000 customers. Basically, in a nutshell, the district is about half the size as a city, and the, we all get our water locally. So um, we have a lot of the same issues, but our problems are a little bit different, and together the collaborative approach really kind of makes a great partnership for the two agencies to move forward on a project. As I said previously, the city of Santa Cruz uh, receives all of their water locally that fall from rainfall that falls from the Santa Cruz Mountains. We're one of the few counties in all of California that does not rely on imported water. The city of Santa Cruz gets about 95% of their water from surface sources, and then about 5% of the remaining sources is a groundwater system in the Live Oak area. The primary problem that the city is facing is water shortage during drought. Because all of the water comes from the rain, as you can see in this graph, there are periods where the shortage is critically dry and below the needs that the city can meet. And so if you can look at the red bars, that shows when they have critically dry situations. The city is uh, facing a time where we will not have enough water for the future. For example, if we were to have a drought similar to the 1976-1977 period, the city is already short of water by 45 percent. Um, the city has been trying to pursue a new water source for over 30 years, and they've grown tremendously. And during that time, they have brought on no new water, but the city has grown. And with that, that shortage then means that the people have not enough water, and the replications would be that they would have to have severe water rationings during these times of drought. Um, that could affect the businesses and the local community. Now, Soquel Creek Water District, although the name implies that we're surface water, we really get our water from the ground. And so we're 100% groundwater uh, relied upon, and the only source that we can get is the water that's under the ground. And over time, what happens is we've drawn out too much, we as well as others in our groundwater basin. And so we are facing an overdraft situation where our groundwater basin cannot sustain the pumping needs of the county. This illustration shows how the uh, groundwater levels in our area, and just for a geographical reference, where that arrow is, and maybe, do I have this here? That's Bargetto Winery, and right in here is Cabrillo College. And the color red is emphasizing that the groundwater levels are below sea level. And when that happens, it can lead to a condition of saltwater intrusion. This animated slide shows that when you have normal rainfall and you have a production well, the normal hydro hydraulic gradient allows for the fresh water uh, interface to still keep the salt water boundary outside. But when you pump too much water, it pulls in that salt water wedge, and what happens is you have seawater intrusion. If seawater intrusion occurs, it's very, very expensive to um, correct the damage, or it's almost irreplaceable, the basin would be. And so what we're trying to do, we have not seen this condition in any of our production wells but we are seeing this in our coastal monitoring well network. So we're trying to keep that saltwater uh, tow out beyond our production wells. This is an illustration of our water portfolios for both the city and the district. And as you can see, even with a conservation and rationing and our existing water sources, 
Both of the agencies have a water deficit. So after trying to look at different projects over the last 30 years that would provide additional water, for some reason or another, and if some of you have gone to our last community meeting, we went in detail on these um, alternatives, there wasn't a project that really could provide enough water for us without looking at it at a more programmatic approach. So this is the integrated water plan, which is a diversified water portfolio program that allows both agencies to incorporate conservation, which both of us have a lot of conservation programs already actively going. It um, includes 15% curtailment during droughts, which would be similar to what we did last year where we reduced our amount of water um, during drought times, and that was primarily for outside water use. Um, the third one is, of course, what we're here tonight to talk about more, which is recycled water. Um, trying to apply recycled water projects where feasible that can also add water to our portfolio. And then the fourth one, which is development of a supplemental water supply. And after um, both agencies conducted a very public process over the last several years, um, the integrated water plan and the integrated resources plan of the agencies both identified desalination as the preferred alternative. The next couple of slides will just um, elaborate on that fourth bullet, and this is the conceptual design of the desalination uh, facility that we're evaluating. It's a two and a half million gallon per day facility. It would be located somewhere in the city of Santa Cruz industrial area. The intake, we are evaluating two possible types. One would be an open ocean intake using an abandoned outfall at Mitchell's Cove. And the other one is um, possibly using subsurface wells, which would take wells from beneath the ground. We are conducting several studies on this, and that topic, among with other um, marine issues, will be focused at our next community meeting, which is on November 10th. Um, and then um, the last bullet is how would the product water, which is the salty water concentrate or the brine be discharged during the desalination process. And the conceptual um, design for that would be to mix that with the existing effluent that's already going out to the bay through the wastewater treatment plant. This slide is just showing how we are um, Conceptually planning on using the plant together, the desalination plant is going to be sized at two and a half million gallons per day, and it would be shared by the city. The city would use it only during times of drought, and so most likely one in six years during the summer months of May through October, they would be pulling two and a half MGD to meet their near needs during summer time. Um, when there wasn't a drought and during um, normal wet conditions, the district would like to use the desalination plant at a much lower rate of about one to one and a half million gallons per day to help um, augment their groundwater system. So we would be using a little bit less of our groundwater system to help it um, recover in this overdraft condition and then during that time we would be using desalination water to help us meet our needs. Since 2007, um, the city and the district have been working together, and this is illustrating some of the projects that we're working on in terms of uh, studies and evaluations to kind of meet the concerns of a desalination project. So um, we have done a pilot plant test to test water quality. That was done um, last year. As I said, we're doing an intake uh, analysis with two studies and a feasibility study. And we'll also be looking at the energy component of desalination. Energy is obviously um, something that is a big concern to both uh, the public as well as the two agencies. So we are looking at ways to reduce energy and reduce carbon. Um, the last bullet I think I already went on, so I will go to the next one. This is just illustrating our schedule. As I talked about, in 2008, we did our pilot study. We are now going to be embarking on um, the environmental review, which would mean that we will be starting our project EIR. Um, if the project is certified, then we hope to do, and we have a design of the facility, then the project could be construction uh, constructed in 2012 
and then be actually maybe online in 2015. This is the last line, and it's just saying that there are numerous ways for people to learn more about our project. We have um, an active email update that goes out once a month to people. If you haven't received one, please sign up. It's, um, a sign-up sheet is at the table. You can also go onto our website and sign up. And if you have any uh, questions, you, um, I'll be here at the end, so thank you. So the next four presentations that we're going to have tonight will focus on water recycling. And we're very fortunate tonight to have Dr. David Smith, who's the Managing Director for Water Reuse um, Association, the California chapter based out in Sacramento. Um, Dave just came back from a conference and has a lot of knowledge on the uh, recycled water overview of the state, the different terms, the different types of uses. Um, the regulations on recycled water, and then also kind of what's ahead. So, thank you, Dave. Well, Melanie just took care of my first two slides. I'm um, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fine. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the organization um, that, that I represent, and then go on and talk a little bit about uh, water recycling in general, and then other speakers are going to talk about water recycling specifically in this area. Um, the Water Use Association is uh, a group that was formed by utilities like the ones hosting this meeting tonight to create an organization that would um, be a place where experience uh, and advocacy could um, come together and uh, inform the regulatory approach, inform the legislative um, things going on related to water recycling and desalination. And we find ourselves, in fact a lot of my time is involved in working with regulators to keep them informed about what it's like to operate a water recycling plant or a uh, desal facility uh, and make sure that we have regulations that protect public health um, but allow for recycling to go on in a way that's economically feasible. This organization also uh, uh, funds uh, about $2 million a year in, in research on public health uh, and treatment technology for both desalination and, and water recycling. Um, and that money comes from the federal government. It comes from our own uh, members and subscribers. The, the membership, uh, the, the backbone of the membership of water reuse is utilities like um, the, the city of, of uh, Santa Cruz and the SoCal uh, Water District. Uh, we also have major engineering consulting firms as our members. Um, and uh, in California, we've got about 180 members. And that represents about, I'm thinking, somewhere between 80 and 85 percent of the water recycled in the state. So um, we're the primary organization uh, addressing water recycling needs of the industry and, and providing information to the public and legislators and regulators. Okay, so I thought I'd take a minute and describe how water recycling fits into the constellation of uh, uh, water supply options for communities like this one. And you'll see on the left here a list of, and not a complete list, but, but a list of the typical sources that communities look to, especially those on the coast, seawater is on here, um, but for others that aren't on the coast, groundwater, sometimes um, impaired or salty groundwater exists inland too, and that represents a source for uh, of water. Recycled water, rainwater, gray water, these are all typical sources that you might be familiar with. And then they each require a certain level of treatment to comply with regulations or just simply to make them suitable for use. And then the uses that they could be put to are shown here on the right. Uh, either potable supply or non-potable supplies. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in a minute about what some of the non-potable supplies are, but we all know um, what, what our drinking water, you know, what we want it to taste like and, and do for us. So just focusing in on each one of these here for a minute, um, typical surface and groundwater, you just heard a minute ago, this community derives its water, primarily the city from surface water and uh, the district from groundwater. Uh, Th those supplies need a little bit of treatment to comply with regulations and to make them safe, and they become a great potable supply, and there's a network of pipes throughout the community to distribute it to uh, just about every uh, home and business in, in the service area. Seawater uh, can be desalinated uh, with a reverse osmosis process, and then it becomes potable supply and can be introduced right into the uh, this water 
distribution system. Recycled water has a number of uses, uh, and Todd's going to talk in a few minutes about uh, the, the kinds of treatment that um, water rec recycled water needs before it can be used. Um, some filtration, some disinfection, but once it's um, uh, received that level of treatment, it can be distributed as a non-potable supply for irrigating golf courses and uh, food crops that are eaten raw. It's, um, it's safe for many, many uses. I'm going to list some of those in a few minutes. Um, it can also be used as a potable supply. Um, after treatment with uh, technology such as reverse osmosis, and then current regulations require that it be passed through the ground and mixed with groundwater, removed, treated with the rest of the potable supply for the community, and distributed as a potable supply. And I'm going to talk in a few minutes about where some of the communities are in this um, state that are doing this. Um, this is called indirect potable reuse. In the future, and it's not possible now, uh, but in the future it may be possible under uh, regulations that don't currently exist to um, do some reverse osmosis, some additional treatment, and that additional treatment hasn't been defined what's needed to make it safe yet, uh, it could possibly be introduced directly into the drinking water supply, and that would be called direct potable reuse. And that is not uh, done anywhere in this country yet. It's done in one place in the world uh, by design, and that's in, in Namibia and South Africa. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the long-term horizon for that option as well, but it is not an option today under current regulations. And rainwater and gray water uh, become a convenient uh, potable or non-potable supply for uh, primarily uh, homeowners that want to capture water and uh, uh, use it as a uh, irrigation supply or for other uses in the home environment. And the California Plumbing Code was recently revised to allow for much more liberal use of, of, uh, of gray water systems. Okay, so what are some of the uses of recycled water in California? The primary use, uh, although I'll, I'll show some, a little pie chart in a minute, uh, there's a lot of landscape irrigation going on. Um, that requires uh, that that water be distributed, and sometimes that's an expensive proposition to get that water conveyed from where it's produced at a wastewater treatment plant and a recycled uh, uh, water treatment facility out to where it's used, but it's done uh, where it makes sense in this state. And it doesn't make sense everywhere. Um, that kind of distribution system can also supply water to um, uh, facilities that have dual plumbing. And by dual plumbing, I mean inside a building like this, there could be uh, two sets of pipes, one purple for recycled water, and it can be used for flushing toilets and that kind of thing. And it can be used for uh, swimming pools as well, although it's not done here, I don't believe. Um, and it's permitted in condominiums for uh, uh, in a residential setting uh, for uh, uh, toilet flushing as well. North of here in Sonoma County, uh, there's about 12,000 acre feet uh, to 15,000 acre feet used each year to generate steam uh, by putting it down in the earth onto hot rocks and they collect the steam and generate power for the city that um, produces that water in Sonoma County. Indirect potable supply, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, putting the water into the ground and taking it back out or putting it in a large uh, storage reservoir prior to use. Uh, and then on the right here there's a list of the typical uh, uses where there are users next to a distribution system. They have found it useful for uh, concrete bash plants. Cooling towers, many buildings inland require uh, uh, evaporative cooling systems and they can use recycled water for that. There's a place in Orange County that's using it for carpet dyeing, uh, management of moisture in, in composting facilities. Commercial laundries use it uh, for uh, uh, washing and it's used in uh, car washes. So in California, there's about 650,000 acre feet a year of recycling going on. And in an acre foot of water, there's about 350,000 gallons. And so this is a list of, of how it's, it's used. Groundwater recharge here is 177,000, and that groundwater recharge is synonymous with either indirect potable reuse or um, seawater uh, intrusion barriers. You just heard about seawater intrusion being an issue. In some communities, they find it effective to use recycled water to create a barrier between the sea and their drinking water wells. 
it's not feasible or appropriate everywhere, but where the geology works, it's, it's a good solution. And the CII stands for Commercial, uh, Institutional, and Industrial Use. Just give you an idea of what's happening in California. California has a goal of getting from 650,000 to um, uh, 2 million acre feet. So about a three-fold increase in the next 20 years. Um, and so as, a, as an organization, we're involved in identifying ways of achieving that statewide policy goal. Okay, so in California, a water recycling program needs to comply with regulations called, the, the, in the state um, health and safety code, code is called t Title 22, and it establishes treatment requirements for groundwater recharge and reservoir augmentation. And that's what I mean by indirect portable reuse. So if you're going to incorporate recycled water into your drinking water supply, there's some regulations that have to be um, attained, and they're listed here. And that regulation also lists the requirements for these other uses that, that I've described. There are also policies that other agencies have, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, the State Water Resources Control Board, um, also regulate. So it's just important, I point this out just because um, it's, not, uh, it's not, it's a regulated industry, let me put it that way. Any utility that wants to start a recycling program can, but there's a strict set of regulations that need to be complied with. Okay, so I want to focus a little bit on this groundwater recharge because that is probably the most, um, or, or a very cost-effective way in some communities to incorporate uh, recycled water into their water supply portfolio that you heard that term introduced a few minutes ago. And this slide reflects those Title 22 regulations. And uh, uh, there's kind of two pathways for compliance. You start with municipal wastewater, and uh, uh, you create recycled water from that by going to one more treatment step of filtration and, and uh, additional disinfection. And you can spread it on the ground. Uh, and the requirements for that are that you need to get about 50% of your water when you pull it out from some other source besides recycled water, and it needs to spend about six months in the ground. There's some flexibility in regulations, but that's the general rule of thumb. So what does a surface spreading operation look like? Well, this is a schematic of, of what it might look like, where you've got a pond on the surface, and where there's the right geology, the right soils, that water can percolate into the ground and become part of the groundwater table. And then maybe off the one side of this picture, there would be a, a well that would extract the, the water that includes uh, a, a fraction of, of recycled water. Um, then down here on the bottom, if you don't use surface spreading, you can inject the water directly, but if you do that, it needs additional treatment than if you percolate it into the ground. And that's because when you percolate it into the ground, there's some treatment that occurs in the soil. But if you're going to inject it right into the aquifer, you have to give it more treatment under the current regulations. So what does that kind of system looks like, look like? Um, you blend the water up on the surface, and then you inject it um, with a well that, instead of extracting water, it pumps it into the ground. And then you extract it down gradient, that is, um, down the, the groundwater flow direction, um, you extract the water, that is a blend of recycled water and uh, the, the native groundwater, or the water you've blended which in some communities comes from the Colorado River or the Delta or their local surface waters. There's a couple of ways to achieve this um, goal that some communities have of incorporating recycled water into their drinking water supply to, to augment it. And these, this is a list of some of those that do using these two methods, um, surface application and subsurface application. And these all happen to be in Southern California. They're ahead of us in Northern California because there's more people there and there's less water. And, and this is uh, a map that shows you the LA Basin and surrounding areas uh, about where the, the projects are. Uh, this, these, this cross represents, the plus sign represents the projects that are being planned, and the star represents projects that are already uh, in operation. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this particular project in Orange County, Orange County Water District's project. And here's a schematic of how it operates. It incorporates, it produces um, uh, uh, 
highly treated product. It's reverse osmosis and then another level of treatment um, uh, to disinfect and to oxidize organic compounds that uh, make it through the, the uh, reverse osmosis facility. And then uh, it's, the water is conveyed to one of a couple of locations. It's conveyed up a pipeline uh, where there are, in the near future, going to be uh, injecting the water and percolating it to the ground. Um, and right now, they take it all the way up to this um, area in the upper part of their groundwater basin and percolate it into the ground. They're also injecting it into a series of seawater intrusion barrier wells. In fact, that's how the project started over, I think, 30 years ago. And this cost at about $476 per acre foot represents um, uh, a high cost relative to um, uh, some sources of water uh, or elsewhere in the state, but it is the lowest cost water for them. And so they chose to undertake this project. But it doesn't work for everybody. Um, it works for them because they've got the geology. Um, uh, some communities don't have the right geology to get the recycled water and additional surface water into the ground. There are regulations that allow you to put it in a reservoir, but some communities don't have a large enough reservoir to make meaningful use of the recycled water as part of their uh, drinking water supply either. Um, so th that's one reason why some communities don't have an indirect portable reuse system. The major limitation on this direct quotable reuse, I said, is I think pretty obvious, and that is it's not permissible under current regulations at the moment. Um, there's an effort to develop that um, uh, statewide. That's a five to ten year program, though, to develop regulations for that. I also mentioned um, non quotable uses that require a distribution system. So that's a whole new set of infrastructure that needs to be laid in streets that's disruptive to tear up streets and, and lay a whole new network of pipes and it can be expensive. But for some communities, that makes sense. That's what they have, and that's what they have determined is the cost-effective uh, source, next source of their water. But again, for some communities, that is not the case. So what's coming out there? Well, um, in terms of regulations, there's a whole suite of compounds called emerging contaminants. You might have heard about uh, these contaminants of emerging concern that we're beginning to realize that some compounds in our wastewater have adverse health effects if they're not removed. Um, and so there's a great deal of study going on uh, to uh, figure out which ones are problematic and how to remove them. Um, the State Department of Public Health is expanding their water recycling, uh, recycled water inspection program. Um, uh, there are new regulations regarding how you can store recycled water in surface ponds. So I, I won't go on through all this, but just suffice it to say that this is a highly regulated environment. Um, and uh, most of those regulations are appropriate to protect public health. Um, and uh, not all of them, though, I think it's important to recognize uh, that some of these regulations are just costly um, and uh, aren't uh, necessarily needed to protect public health. But in the main, the State Department of Public Health is doing an ex excellent job in that regard. And so any portable reuse system or any recycled system that provides uh, recycled water to the public can be considered safe. Um, and so I'll just stop there and uh, uh, allow the next speaker, Charles. Uh. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. I'm probably going to tell you more about Scotts Valley than you really want to hear in the next, hopefully, only 15 minutes. But I do want to give a background for why we got into recycled water just attended Dave conference that Dave's uh, organization put on last week, and one of the words that was used about describing projects almost to the point where it was a little bit annoying was, what's the driver of your project? But here I am, I want to, first thing I want to do is tell you about the driver to our project, which is, uh, I'm trying to depict in this slide, which is, uh, shows groundwater levels over time along with our groundwater production. Uh, we, um, what this slide is showing is that we had in the early 80s and 90s groundwater declines of uh, up to 200 feet in certain levels. If you're looking at the blue line on the slide, that is groundwater levels over time, and you can see that back around 1980, 
at least at this particular location, we were looking about 500 feet above sea level. By the mid-90s, it's about uh, uh, 350 to 300. And unfortunately, groundwater levels have stabilized. I'll go into some of the reasons why that's happened. But that was the impetus for getting into recycled water, was this rapid decline in groundwater elevations, which understandably was very alarming. A little bit about Scotts Valley Water District. We are largely contiguous with Scotts Valley city boundary. Uh, the city population is about 13,200. The population within our service area is about 11,000. That makes us about one quarter the size of Soquel Creek Water District and about one eighth the size of Santa Cruz City. Our source of water is groundwater. Our source of potable water is groundwater. And um, our potable groundwater demand last year was 1,500 acre feet or in million gallons, 490 million gallons. Uh, that 1,500 acre feet per year term, I want you to re remember looking at this slide, uh, this shows our groundwater use, or our, I should say our water use over time, going back to 1976. That's what the blue bars are. You can see them rising, uh, peaking during the period 1997 to 2004 at an average of about 2,000 acre feet per year. And over the last five or six years, you can see a steady decline. Uh, and now we're at about 1,500 acre feet per year. We are, um, like many other areas, a, a, a small geographical part of a much larger groundwater basin. Uh, you can see Scotts Valley over on the east side of what's called the Santa Margarita Groundwater Basin. So we're a fairly small part of that uh, basin. Also, within that basin is uh, much of San Lorenzo Valley Water District, uh, Pico County Water District, Mount Hermon Association. Uh, we pump about, we're responsible about half of the pumping within the district. The next slide I'm going to show you, just for purposes of comparison, is groundwater pumping in the Scotts Valley area, which uh, is the area that extends down through here, it's this area within that basin. And that pumping in that area, that smaller geographical part, represents about two-thirds to three-quarters of the total basin, pumping in the basin. Now, what I want to show you here is the different uses that groundwater is being put to. Uh, this is, in some ways, the same as that other slide I showed you. Scotts Valley's groundwater use is the dark blue bars at the bottom, that's the same data that I showed you before. That's our groundwater pumping, but on top of that, the different color, that, the, the lighter blue, that's the pumping by San Lorenzo Valley Water District and Mount Hermon. The green uh, parts of those bars, that's private pumping. The orange is industrial well pumping. Mainly that's for the quarry operations in the area. And then the other color at the top is uh, for environmental remediation, uh, starting with uh, one of the Superfund sites, not one of, the Superfund site and other remediation sites in the Scotts Valley area. So there's been all this pumping, you know, only part of which our district is responsible for, but yet, I mean, the, all of this pumping affects the basin and we're trying to implement management solutions, including recycled water, that address this whole complex. But I think another important thing to look at is that while our district's pumping has gone down the last few years, so has the collective pumping, the other sources of pumping. Really, the draw on the basin is considerably reduced. Um, sort of summarize some of the factors that went into the declining groundwater levels in the 80s and 90s. We did have rapid growth in that period, which obviously associated with increased demand, and there was paving and loss of recharge. We had the increasing industrial and particularly quarry use of water the environmental remediation pumping started up. And then, in addition to that, something that, you know, sometimes is, you know, overall it was a good thing, but the wastewater, uh, which was previously disposed of on the land and uh, form, uh, contributed to groundwater recharge, was redirected to the ocean outfall, which had a significant impact as well, no doubt, on the overall water balance. So we now seem to have entered uh, 
hope, thankfully, a period of stabilized groundwater levels. We'd like to see the groundwater levels increase, of course. But there are several factors. Recycle water program, that's why we're here. Uh, the reason why I've gone through all this stuff before then is to say that the improvements that have occurred clearly are not all the result of the Recycle Water Program, but the Recycle Water Program has been an important part of that. Uh, water conservation has been important. I think you can make a case that on a quantitative basis, the water conservation effort has been more important than the water recycling, but obviously they're both, from my perspective, vitally important. The end of the quarry operations has obviously helped. Uh, the, the reduction in environmental remediation pumping, pumping has also helped, and slowdown in, in, in growth has been another factor. So now to our recycled water program, and I think, I'm afraid our recycled water program is not going to be nearly as interesting as the one, some of the ones that Dave talked about. Uh, it's pretty ordinary uh, urban variety. Uh, we, we started construction of the plant in the late 1990s. The first water deliveries were in 2002, and you can see they were quite minimal that year. Again, the water deliveries are the blue bars. The number of customers are the red bars. So at the end of 2009, we were serving 30 customers, and we served 166 acre feet per year. That's a small number to many. Mary's going to talk about numbers much bigger than that. But uh, you know, on the scale of things, that's 11% of our total use. So it's not a trivial percentage at all. Um, this shows our uh, distributions, or our system. Uh, I hope that can be seen. Um, the low point in the system is the treatment plant, which is located here. The treatment plant is owned and operated by Scotts Valley, the city of Scotts Valley. Of course, the water district pays for it, but that, that's there. The high point is our recycled water storage tank here. We have two main transmission lines one running down Mount Hermon Road and one on Scotts Valley Drive. There's additional mains that serve the high school and cross Highway 17 and serve the old Borland building, the Enterprise campus. Then a couple of smaller Civic Center drives serving City Hall and our office building and some parks. Uh, in 2009, we did receive some grant funds, the Integrated Regional Water Management Plan grant funds, which many of you are familiar with. We did construct three recycled mains. There are these green ones, one, two, and three here. Uh, we're in the process of connecting additional customers to those new mains. There'll be, over the next few years, about 20 new customers added and another 40 acre feet or so served from those new mains. There'll, there'll be undoubtedly some additional um, construction in the future. The Scotts Valley Town Center that some of you may have heard about will be located in this area and no doubt we'll have a recycled main that will loop through that area in the future. Our recycled water users are mainly landscaping. Um, as Dave mentioned, that's very common. Uh, we are working at the old uh, the Enterprise Building, the old Borland campus, on a co cooling tower, retrofitting that for recycled water use. We are looking at toilet flushing demonstration projects, not really implementation on a large scale. We are considering a, uh, a, a project, uh, a much larger project, which would provide recycled water to Positivo Golf Course. That's really in the planning stage. There's a lot of details to be worked out. Uh, I do have a slide here. I think um, I don't want to go into the detail of it unless there's any questions. I think the important part from the Water District's perspective, or in the scale of this presentation anyway, is that this is the project that if we were to build it or could come up with some other project that would really fully utilize our recycled water. Right now, we're using 166 acre feet per year. We're thinking that with full utilization during the summer, uh, when the irrigation demands are highest, uh, that we would have about 370 acre feet or so. So with the work in process and with Pasa Tempo, that would be full utilization of our recycled water. You know, if there was some way to store the water that was produced in the winter season and use it, uh, then that would be, uh, uh, you know, an additional use. But based on just the peak summer usage, that's the max. Uh, Scotts Valley, um, for whatever reason, I don't think it's anything that anyone in Scotts Valley has done, and certainly I wasn't personally there when the project was started, has had very high customer acceptance of recycled water. 
This is not true throughout the state. I think um, it um, is good fortune that people have embraced it and even taken something as a symbol of community pride. Um, uh, in any event, um, it, it, there is very good support for the, the project, and we're very thankful that there is. Uh, and uh, among the reasons that that um, that it has been embraced, there are a number of landscape customers, both people with in homeowners associations, condominium projects, but uh, um, commercial properties where lands keeping the landscape um, uh, viable and attractive is important, and uh, having the reliable supply has been uh, thought very vital. We do provide some cost incentives, both in terms both in terms of the ongoing. Uh, uh, cost of the water on a, we subsidize the cost with the potable water customers to a certain extent. We also help customers convert to recycled water with the cost on that side of it. Uh, we do require, the city requires all new development to use recycled water, uh, at least if they're close to the, the uh, recycled lines, and also to install irrigation that's uh, compatible for conversion to recycled water if they're, if they're farther from it. Um, we do also have powers for uh, uh, requiring existing, existing customers who are close to recycle lines. We haven't uh, exercised that um, yet and don't really intend, don't think it's going to be necessary to. You know, I think looking at the recycled water program now almost 10 years later, uh, obviously it was a very expensive project. It cost $8 million and I mean, as you start doing the math, we've got 166 acre feet of yield. It's been it's been very expensive, and it's expensive on an operational basis, year in and year out. Um, and I think initially there probably was a considerable amount of buyer's remorse. But I, you know, I think now looking back on it, um, you know, we do see the the intended benefits in helping with uh, address the groundwater issues that that occurred. I think almost everybody is now feeling that it really was a good investment that we're. We've gone through the rate adjustments that make it um, reasonably affordable. I think uh, uh, the benefits are fair. And there are also some other un unintended benefits that we received that we didn't expect. And particularly for our district operationally, it was really helpful. We didn't expect this at all. And I wanted to show this in this graph here. This shows our monthly water production. The blue bars are our potable, well, our potable water, our wells. And you can see the blue bars are the average from 97 to 2004, and the red and blue lines are the monthly production the last couple of years. And you can see particularly in the peak season months how much lower our potable water demand is now with the Recycle Water Program than it was previously. This has proven to be really helpful. Previously, we had to run all of our wells full bore. Every time it got hot, we were really nervous whether we were going to be able to keep our tanks full. And, you know, heaven forbid we had a problem with the well during one of those periods of time. And we really, right now, there's not a time during the year we can't rest one of our wells. So, um, it, you know, it really has been a great uh, value from that perspective, which was not expected. So, in summary, you know, just to kind of uh, give some background, you know, I don't. Recycle water has worked in retrospect in Scottsdale Valley very nicely. Not sure that the same would be the same everywhere else, but some of the reasons why it's worked in Scotts Valley is the proximity of a treatment plant to our customers. In fact, we have a relatively compact distribution area served by just basically two main transmission lines. We've got a good collaborative treatment partner in the city of Scotts Valley. The project really is appropriate in terms of scale and type. I mean, by that I mean we've got an overdraft problem. The more people use recycled water, the less we pump groundwater. It's a direct benefit addressing the problem. And, you know, the size of our overdraft problem is roughly proportional to the amount of recycled water we're able to produce. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, an appropriate solution in our situation. And it's going to complement our conservation efforts and our groundwater recharge efforts, which, you know, we really, one of the earlier slides I wanted to say that, you know, I wish we could show that some of the reason why we had these stabilized levels was for groundwater recharge efforts. We, we're just, we're really, that's in sort of another area that we have to work on in order to uh, really get <coughs> recovery in our, in our groundwater basin. But all in all, I think recycled water has been very helpful and um, for us in our situation. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's really nice to be here. I, 
I feel like I'm really traveling. I'm in, I've gone north. <laughs> I'm in North County. So um, I'm Mary Bannister. I'm the general manager of the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency, which is uh, located in the southern part of, of uh, Santa Cruz County and also part of northern Monterey County. And I think Charlie and I, who have worked together for years, are both very fortunate in that we're talking about projects that have been constructed. And really in the state of California, I think Dr. Dave can say that they're getting projects built has been a big goal in California. And it's, it's huge that in our, our county we have these really uh, fabulous projects done in a time when water is so precious and any means of conserving and, and um, creating water is a, is a huge value. Um, so my outline, I won't go into this too much, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the Pajaro Valley's problem and our solution, what it took to implement recycled water, and then our situation that is, um, I think, uniquely suited to, to the use of recycled water. So PBWMA was created in 1984, and we have a real agricultural emphasis. The Pajaro Valley is a 110 square mile valley and we rely solely on groundwater. The mission of our agency is to um, balance the ground, overdrafted groundwater basin and preserve agriculture, essentially. Um, we partnered in this, our recycle facility, similar to, I think, what Charlie did, with the city of Watsonville, who already owned and operated a, a wastewater treatment plant down on the Pajaro River, ideally located, and um, now operates, owns and operates our recycled water facility but we have the rights to the water that's produced. Um, our agricultural water use, we are kind of an order of magnitude, maybe bigger than Charlie's situation. We use about an average of 55,000 acre feet a year of uh, groundwater irrigation, and of that, 85% of, of it is used for agriculture. The city of Watsonville's the biggest user they use around 7,000 acre feet of water. There's some other smaller uh, mutuals and what have you, but primarily 85% of the water used down there is used for farming. And it's a very rich, as you probably all know, strawberries and lettuce and raspberries, very rich agricultural community uh, and, and economy down there. Um, our long-term average rainfall is about 22 inches, and this shows that our demands are generally uh, fluctuate based on, on the weather. So this year we had a quite a, a damp, wet spring and a cool summer, so our, our usage isn't shown on here, but it, it'll be down a little bit compared to this average usage shown here. And the blue line is just uh, agricultural water use. This municipal and industrial use is not shown. So again, I, we hydrology types love these maps. Um, the contour shown in these, on this map is the groundwater level. So it's the contour of the groundwater level. And we coastal basins, any time the groundwater is below sea level, we're allowing, when we have exposure to uh, lithologic ex exposure to seawater, we're allowing that heavier seawater to move in and, and displace the fresh water. So in this photo, um, this was a groundwater contour map done in April of 2005. A lot of the valley is at sea level. The red uh, lines are where we're below sea level. However, however, this is after a whole winter of recharge and, and very reduced pumping so that the levels of groundwater do somewhat recover. This is the bad news. This is September 2008, and in, at the end of a, a heavy pumping season, as you can see, most of the valley's groundwater levels are below sea level. Some as many as 20 gets up to 30 and more feet below sea level. So very obviously, we're allowing them for the gradient to reverse and the seawater to move in. And this is the result of that. So that yellow line toward the, the north, you can see San Andreas Road, the Pajaro River in the center. Let's see if I can make this work. So this is Elkhorn Slough right here. So the Elkhorn Slough whams us from the, the behind area of this part of the basin. This is around three miles inland that the seawater's moved. Uh, this, this is the Pajaro River. And our basin boundary goes down to about here. Um, in the south. And then to the north, there's La Selva Beach. So our boundary to the north is, is La Selva Beach Freedom Boulevard. So you can see that over much of our basin uh, in the coastal area, we have seawater intrusion. 
<coughs> so in the, our 2002 basin management plan, um, we defined some projects to bring our basin back into balance. And at that time, we talked about imported Central Valley Project water and an import pipeline. That concept has since been sort of put on ice due to the issues in the Delta. The, our board took that out of our, our suite of projects and we'll be updating our basin management plan and looking at other alternatives to try and, and uh, help get our basin back into balance. Um, we also included the recycled water project and a Harkin Slough project that's currently constructed. So um, re recycled water was recognized at that time as a likely supplemental supply. And fortunate for us, which is different for both Scotts Valley and our area here, recycled water was recognized as a likely supplemental supply before any infrastructure was built. So the Harkin Slough project was the first project we actually constructed, and that Construction, I think, was begun in 99, 2000, and at that time we had no pipe in the ground. So from day one, as we started building the big infrastructure, we knew that we were probably going to be de delivering recycled water, and we uh, constructed the project accordingly. Um, so what we constructed was 20 miles of pipeline, and all of that pipe is what we call purple pipe. The requirements when you deliver recycled water. Um, that the pipe be purple and marked and there be signage and various things. And so at the time that we did construction, we, were, we knew and were planning to, to deliver recycled water. In the, in the case of a residential air neighborhood, you come in later and put pipes in to deliver recycled water if the project's constructed later. Very expensive, and I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of that. So um, our blended water supply source is about 6,000 acre feet now. We probably need about double that, so we're only maybe halfway there. Um, we have 2,000 acre feet per year from Harkin Slough and Blend Wells, and we also have a connection to the city, city potable supply that gets the pumping away from the coast. One of the strategies in our basin management plan is to move pumping away from the coast so we're not directly pulling both horizontal and, and vertically the seawater in, and then 4,000 acre feet a year of recycled water. So here's our, um, our existing coastal distribution system, and this was just completed about a year and a half ago. So this is Derry Road, San Andreas Road is, is right in here. So we're just north of Beach, this is West Beach, Pajaro Dunes, if you're familiar with with that area, the Paro River, and then this is Highway 1 going south, and then it turns and, and the power plant down at Moss Landing is right about here. So I'll give you your bearings. And again, there's Elkhorn Slough, so there's our southern boundary. So the pipes go down to the south along Highway 1. They serve all these fields on the east of Highway 1 and um, all this agricultural area. And the only area that's not being served right now because we didn't have the funding to build the pipe and didn't have the water supplies, there's this little area in here. And then, and then all of this area is served. So here's the Ar Park and Slough Project, aqu Aquifer Storage and Recovery Project. That's about a 12-acre basin that we currently put floodwaters out of Harkin Slough in, but as Dr. Dave was talking about earlier, this might be a very uh, suitable location for us to put recycled water at some point if we can start to deal with the, the other um, state requirements regarding recharge of recycled water. Um, there are potable wells nearby and, and other issues that we would have to deal with. Um, one of the other limitations in our project is that we have irrigation de demand during the summer months. During the winter months we have no irrigation demand at all. And so the, our plant will be shut down probably from roughly December through March. And in the state of California, with the crisis we have right now, the thought that, that there would be potential for creating water and have that not be turned on for any part of the year, I think, I think we need a big state grant to help us figure out a way to, another, a way to, uh, to, to utilize that water for more of the year. Um, so Harkin Slough has been diverting floodwaters to that recharge basin since 2002, and we recharged about 6,000 acre feet of water. 
um, we're, we need to figure out a better way. The original design was to then turn around and extract that same amount of water. We haven't been as successful in getting that water out, but we have some help from Dr. Andy Fisher at UCSC and Dr. Rosemary Knight at Stanford and others have been working to try and help us uh, improve the function of extracting that water. But 6,000 acre feet of water going into a coastal basin is certainly a benefit. So um, we're happy, at least pleased with that part of it. The uh, Recycle Water Project, as I said, reduces ocean discharge to the National, I say it, Monterey Marine Sanctuary. And um, again, it's similar to the Castroville project. We were fortunate that in Castroville, they've been delivering recycled water for about 15 years. And so we had a model and the farmers, many of the farmers that farm down there also farm in Watsonville and were very savvy about how, what the restrictions were and what the benefits were and they're, they're very pleased. Our, I shouldn't say probably publicly, but our water quality is quite a bit better than Castroville. <laughs> so we're bigger and better. Um, Location, location, location. One of the very fortunate things for us is that the existing wastewater treatment plant was located on the Palmer River. This is the old plant, and this is the new portion of the plant here. And we, Melanie was out on a tour last week. We'd love for all of you to come on a tour sometime in the future. But um, it's a, really a beautiful facility. Um, and as Dr. Dave said, we need to meet the t strict Title 22 standards, we have to have separation, pur purple pipe designation, in, uh, signage in English and Spanish, and I have a sign there, and I don't know, a couple around the room. Um, and I, I, my way of saying it, Dave, is that it would be drinkable except that the nutrients are removed, so it would be like drinking miracle Grow. So that's, I don't know if you told me that. But one of the benefits of recycled water for irrigation is that it does have nitrates, and nitrates haven't been removed. For, so for agricultural use in the Pajaro Valley, it's an added benefit in that the nitrates get taken up, get a second chance at getting taken up, and um, it improves the water quality by removing those nitrates and reducing the amount of fertilizer that's needed uh, to be used in the fields. And the, the growers in the Paro Valley, I think, are probably the most sophisticated around in terms of irrigation efficiency and um, application of, of uh, pesticides and uh, uh, fertilizers. So I think um, they're very, very well versed in how to take advantage of the nitrates in the water. Um, there are a lot of restrictions, again, to, to using uh, recycled water, agricultural wells have to have backflow prevention devices. If there's any potable hookup at all, we have to have what they call an air gap. So it has to be a physical break so that there's no chance of recycled water and those nutrients back, going back into the groundwater aquifer. This is a backflow prevention device. You all probably don't care too much about that. Um, I love the, blue, the lavender color of the pipes. Um, we, have, we have detailed training for all the ag users. We have many, many Spanish speakers, so we have uh, fluent Spanish speakers on staff that go out and do the training and, uh, and repeat the training fairly regularly. And we have um, emergency procedures, water ordering procedures, a lot of signage requirements. As you can see on that pipe, there's a signage that says not for drinking, it's irrigation water. And um, we've also, there, I, you know, I joke about the, the funding. We also have actually been very fortunate in re receiving quite a bit of grant support for our project. California is very um, enthusiastic about getting more recycled water developed. We got a Prop 13 grant for about $16 million toward the plant, uh, Prop 50, about $11 million, and a Federal Bureau of Reclamation Title 16 uh, grant for $20 million. Um, <laughs> Now I'm embarrassed because Dr. Dave had much fresher numbers than I pulled out of some old report. But uh, as he said, about 650,000, not 500,000 acre feet are being reused. And um, at the time I got this information, 4 million acre feet a year, uh, per year of used uh, tr uh, wastewater was being discharged into the ocean. So it seems ridiculous to discharge water that can be so aptly um, reused for irrigation. And just a couple pictures, I think I'm out of time, but uh, the plant is really a, a state-of-the-art plant, really a, a facility that we in the city and the valley are, are proud of. Um, 
I obviously didn't take these with my Blackberry or they wouldn't look so nice, these pictures. <laughs> but again, we need to find storage alternatives for the winter to keep the plant operational and continue to produce up to maybe 6,000 acre feet. I think we're missing out on about 2,000 acre feet a year right now of potential production. The operations center was built and paid for by the city of Watsonville, not the Valley Farmers who really wouldn't have been too happy about that, but <laughs> it is a, a, a gorgeous facility. They use recycled in their toilets and for irrigation, and they circulate it through the flooring to uh, cool the building. It's, it's really an amazing facility. Um, there's a little kitchen or their dining area. They have a lab. A lot of our, our analyses are done. We, we have um, third-party analyses done of all of our water fairly regularly so that we always are testing it ourselves. The city maintains a very stringent, strident testing program, but we also have third-party analysis to be sure that um, we're staying within compliance. So thank you very much. You don't get to ask questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Our last speaker um, is Todd Reynolds. He's a senior engineer for Kennedy Jenks Consultants. Todd has been working with the city and the district for the last couple of years, and most recently, he's written a white paper on recycled water uh, opportunities and limitations. And we have a couple copies here tonight, and this document is available on the website. I think we printed about 25. So if you'd like one after, um, the question and answer session and the end of the meeting, you can go get one on the table. And Todd's presentation is going to pretty much highlight what's in this report. Sorry, I hope I steal your thunder on that. Well, good evening. Um, so we've heard uh, nice presentations about Scotts Valley and Pajaro, and so now we're going to shift and look at uh, Santa Cruz and Soquel Creek and the opportunities and challenges for recycled water uh, locally here. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about the conservation programs, gray water and rainwater capture programs that uh, the city and district are already doing, uh, and then look at the uh, potential opportunities and challenges for different kinds of recycled water uh, opportunities we've seen uh, here for Santa Cruz and, and the district. So both the city and the district have ongoing conservation and rebate programs uh, to reduce their daily average water demand. So uh, average water use for the city and the district is about 75 gallons per person per day, which is about half of what is um, the average here in the state of California. So they're doing a really good job of, of conserving. Um, they've also worked to uh, get the, the plumbing ordinances changed to permit uh, the use of uh, rainwater cisterns and graywater systems, and the district actually has rebate programs for those, similar to uh, rebate programs for uh, replacing your toilet or getting more efficient um, clothes washers. Um, the city and the district are also investigating opportunities for recycled water. And, um, the city is currently is already using recycled water at their wastewater treatment plant. Um, and they're looking at, as we you know, I'll talk about later here, possible irrigation of golf courses or parks or other um, opportunities here in the community. And uh, two specifically, the Pasatanto Golf Course and, uh, and the Seascape Golf Course in the, for the district. So their different uses of recycled water require different levels of treatment. Um, so the water that comes out of a wastewater treatment plant that meets state and federal guidelines for treatment for discharge to a river or the ocean or the spring ground is called secondary effluent. And generally for irrigation purposes, you just need a filtration process and some disinfection, and that allows you to use it for general irrigation. And so that's shown by this first um, filtration process. Now sometimes if you have too much salt in that recycled water source, or there's other constituents that need to be removed, then uh, re reverse osmosis or desalting process is used. Um, and that will bring the water again for irrigation or for possibly industrial uses such as a cooling tower. If you have too much salt in the cooling tower, as uh, the water evaporates, the salt stays behind and plugs up the tower. 
Uh, then for indirect potable reuse, as, as Dr. Smith was talking about, um, additional treatment processes would be tried. So you'd have to do all three, and there's advanced uh, oxidation processes that are involved. So the city of Santa Cruz has a, a source of wastewater, a secondary effluent of their wastewater treatment plant. It treats about 7 to 10 million gallons per day of sec to secondary effluent standards. Uh, most of the water is discharged about two miles offshore in the Pacific Ocean, um, but there is some that is used right currently recycled on site at the plant for wash down water and, and uh, irrigation on the plant site and other kind of uses at the facility. Uh, right now, the wastewater plant does not have the additional treatment processes that will be required to produce uh, recycled water for irrigation or other purposes off site. Uh, so the city has, has looked at recycled water through their integrated water plan um, for over a decade and, and before. Um, and there were some studies done in 2000 and 2002 that looked at a number of alternative water supplies. And that study looked at direct potable reuse opportunities, at urban landscape and irrigation, at agri agricultural uh, applications on the North Coast, and uh, working with Scotts Valley for recycled water, as well as groundwater recharge. So I'm going to go, th I'll talk about projects in each of these categories. So direct potable reuse, uh, we've already heard that this isn't permitted uh, currently under state regulations, but um, the opportunity would be to treat the recycled water very high levels and then put it directly in the potable water system. And the value for this is that it provides actual potable water into your pipe, into your distribution system. And you don't have to build uh, a separate piping distribution system through a community like Santa Cruz, which is already essentially built out. Uh, you're not tearing up all the streets and, and putting in uh, very expensive piping. Um, the, the challenge, as we've already heard, is so the, the infrastructure requirements for this would be that we would need a new treatment facility. Uh, the tr process I showed earlier, the three steps, or, or potentially more. And, uh, but this approach is currently not permitted by the Department of Health and is not being done uh, anywhere in the U.S. And as Dr. Smith said, only in, in uh, is it Namibia or in Africa, in one place it's been used. The recycled water projects in Singapore and Australia that perhaps you've heard about are all doing um, either indirect potable use or augmenting of existing very large reservoirs, so um, indirect reuse. So landscape irrigation, uh, similar to Scotts Valley, is an opportunity for the city of Santa Cruz. And essentially this is where the water is delivered um, to golf courses, parks, fields, car washes, other uh, non potable uses. Um, so the infrastructure that would be required for this would be a new treatment processes at the facility to treat it to the level that's appropriate for the use. Um, and a new separate piping distribution system to get it to the users. Uh, the challenges in Santa Cruz are that the, the, there's very limited urban irrigation demands and those demands that do exist are located very far apart to the city. So you need, it's, uh, Scotts Valley is uh, fortunate they could have just two relatively short distribution lines to get a lot of their, their service. Um, we don't have that same opportunity here in Santa Cruz. Um, and another nuance to the sort of city of Santa Cruz is that in the integrated water plan, we've already accounted for restrictions to, to irrigation supply during a drought. So in the drought, the city will cut off or, or restrict ration the irrigation of parks and landscapes and such. And the potable water, the, the water need is for potable water. And so while there's benefit to recycled water in that it keeps the, the playgrounds open and the parks green and the golf courses operating, it doesn't meet the city's drought potable water supply needs. There's an opportunity for irrigation for agriculture uh, on the north coast, and in this case, the concept would be that the recycled water would be treated at the wastewater plant and piped up to farmers along the north coast, and that they would then give us their groundwater that they currently, or give Santa Cruz the groundwater that they currently use. 
So the infrastructure required for that would be again treatment processes at the plant to meet the, the need. And then piping that would go up the, up the coast and then also bring the groundwater down the coast. Um, unfortunately, the groundwater basin up there along the north coast is limited and doesn't provide enough water. So the two million, two and a half million gallons per day number you heard uh, is equivalent to about uh, 2,800 acre feet per year. And um, so the groundwater, base, uh, the groundwater basin doesn't have that much water. And also the State Parks Department and uh, ag the agriculture users up in the North Coast are not really interested. The, we went to them and said, okay, we've got this great idea, we'd like to swap water with you. And they said, no, thank you, but no thank you. We like our groundwater. And so um, there's some challenges with that, with that approach. Uh, as Mr. McNeish talked about, there is the possibility of irrigating the Pasa Temple Golf Course with recycled water. This would actually be using the water from Scotts Valley. There's water flowing down the hill, and we could um, treat it and use it to irrigate the golf course. Now, right now, the golf course uses potable water from the city of Santa Cruz, and so that would be a, um, a benefit, although still in a drought, um, because we would, they would cut off the golf course during the drought, it provides benefits to Pasa Campo, and, and, but uh, it doesn't meet the water's demand. So the infrastructure <laughs> required here would be a satellite uh, reclamation plant. And this is where you take, instead of treating all the water at the wastewater plant and then piping it off to the customer, you intercept the wastewater line at the customer site, so right next to the golf course and you treat just what you need there and supply it to the golf course. And it can, um, where, where it works very well, where you have a big system and, and users far apart, but I'll talk in a minute, there are some limitations with that also. And so there is uh, work ahead here. We're uh, conducting a feasibility study of this concept because there is value from the overall regional perspective of this um, recycled water project. So I'm going to transition to Soquel Creek Water District. Now, the district does not uh, treat or reclaim any wastewater in its area. The county collects all the wastewater in the piping systems and delivers <coughs> it to the city of Santa Cruz wastewater treatment plant. Um, so right off the bat, the initial challenges for recycled water at Soquel would be we'd have to pipe to, to treat it at the wastewater plant and pipe it and send it all back over five miles back to the district's uh, geography area. Uh, there's also a limited irrigation market in the district um, and the district does not serve any, out, any agriculture. As part of the integrated uh, resources plan study, uh, SoCal did, has evaluated recycled water opportunities. Uh, recently in 2006 and then uh, in 2009, and for the district, the opportunity were more on looking at the satellite reclamation plants. And these are, can be used when a, when a large regional system with the, with the piping infrastructure backbone is just too expensive um, and not practical. And you would treat the wastewater locally at the site with small localized plants. Um, the district received a state grant to conduct feasibility studies of this. And the benefits are you don't need the lengthy distribution system from the wastewater plant and the source, the treatment is all in close proximity to one another. Um, so there's an opportunity, there's some golf courses that um, could be irrigated with this approach and the Seascape golf course is, is one that it, through the evaluation process uh, made the most sense. Uh, the challenges for other locations throughout the district are that, uh, again, there's a, only a limited number of, and, and what you need is a, a user with a large enough water demand that it makes sense to invest the treatment in the satellite plant at that location. Um, also, you need to have a balance between the demand of the golf course, in this example, and the wastewater that's going by. So you have to have more wastewater going by in the pipe than the golf course would use. So you have to you know, search around and find the, the right matching. Um, another challenge is that the seascape golf course is not a 
um, a customer of the district. So even though it could be beneficial for them to use recycled water, it, it would not lessen the total demands of the district. Um, and, it's, and it's also, in this case, very expensive on a unit dollar acre foot um, basis. And so this graphic shows, and I want to convey as a recycled water cost for irrigation, the cost can really vary depending on the levels of treatment required and on local factors and locations. So what I, what I have here is, um, this is a figure of, this is the Redwood City Recycled Water Program, and it's um, a large urban area, and they're delivering, they're treating water plant, and they've put in the, the infrastructure and the piping. Um, this is the Ski Skate Golf Course Satellite Reclamation Project, and this is a, a desalination project, just for example. Um, the red bar is the cost per acre foot of water, and the blue or greenish bars here are the amount of water in acre feet per year that that system would provide. So um, here at Redwood City, um, they provide about 2,000 acre feet per year of irrigation water to the community. Um, the capital cost of that project was about $80 million. And the life cycle cost, which includes capital and operating cost, is about $2,500 per acre foot. So the Seascape Irrigation Golf Course Project uh, would only provide about 135 acre feet of water. So already you can see that because it's such a small amount, the cost per unit volume is going to go up. Um, also, because you're doing you're doing a full wastewater treatment plant and a little package plant, it's a little more expensive. So you can see it's about seven thousand dollars acre foot. It's, I think it was on the order of maybe eight million dollars in capital cost, but when you look at the cost and the, the amount of water you get for that cost, um, it's very expensive. Um, seawater desalination, this is um, just an example of the av average cost for projects um, that are, are built or in process or projected um, in California are about two thousand to three thousand dollars per acre foot. So in this range, so I've shown about twenty five hundred dollars per acre foot. And um, in this case, this shows um, 2,800 acre-feet per year, which is about what uh, the city and the district are looking for. But with a desal plant, you could essentially, you know, you're, you're looking to match the demand that you need as opposed to taking what's available at the, the recycled water system. I'm sorry, what plant is this? This is, this is not any specific plant, it's just an example of the average, the average cost of a number of facilities is about $2,000 to $3,000 per foot. And then the, the volume that you can produce is depending on the plant that you build. So, we saw, um, so now we'll shift to indirect reuse through groundwater recharge. And um, Dr. Smith went through this. Essentially, there's two routes. Uh, one is through the surface spreading ponds or the injection wells. Um, both requiring some time in the ground. And so the, what, the recharge requires about six month separation distance from where you would uh, inject the water to where you would draw it out from the uh, a drinking water well. And that, that distance, it's, a, it's six months, which is time. But what that means is it's the time for water to move through the geology to get to the well, and so in each little each geography area, you have to look at the soil conditions and calculate that distance based on your local conditions. Now, also, an important factor here is that to do groundwater recharge, you need at least 50% supply of blending water, and that's essentially either surface water or groundwater that you blend with your recycled water to put back in, into the ground. And so. The opportunities there would be um, replenishing, primarily for the district. The city uh, gets 95% of its water from surface water, and so very, very limited opportunity to recharge the 5% of groundwater uh, use that they do. But for the district, if you're looking at replenishing the overdrafted basin with recycled water for e either through the percolation ponds or injection wells. Um, so the infrastructure that would be required would be numerous, uh, numerous injection wells would be needed because the geology here uh, 
is poor in terms of both pulling water out of the ground, but also pushing water in to, to, <coughs> to distribute it um, pretty quickly. Um, also, uh, the district serves thousands, or there's thousands of dr other private drinking water wells in the district uh, area. And so finding those distances so that you can put an injection well that you're not going to impact other wells is, would be uh, very complicated. Um, and the urban nature of both the city and the district make a uh, very large percolation pond. The, the kind of big open basins you see in Orange County in Southern California, um, impractical for the, the urban environment here and with the mountains right there. Um, and then probably the most important factor is that you need 50% blending water to be able to recycle this water. And the big problem is that the district and the city don't have this excess water um, that would be able to blend with the recycled water. The, the San, uh, San Lorenzo River is already completely um, accounted for, and no more water can be taken out of the, the local watershed and surface streams. And the groundwater basin is overdrafted, so that's a, a, one of the major challenge here for this approach. So, in summary, um, the, both the city and the district have active conservation and rebate programs and have evaluated um, what I call opportunities for major recycled water programs. Um, under current California regulations, uh, recycled water is not permitted to be directly used as a drinking water. And that's, as opposed to water supplies, is what the main, issue, the main driver is. Um, now, recycled water projects could provide irrigation water which um, would provide value to the community, um, but they, don't, they do not offset the, there's not enough to offset the water demands for the drought conditions. Um, and the groundwater recharge projects, like in Orange County, um, are not practical for the city or district. So the city and district will continue to evaluate opportunities uh, for recycled water, but it's not a, um, ma a major solution for the potable water supply. And Melanie talked about the white paper. It's uh, on the website. And I'm happy to join the panel now and, uh, for questions. forgot to mention that um, for everybody who's probably already seen, we are videotaping um, this meeting and it will be shown on community television. Thank you to our videographer, Drew. Um, we did video the history of water planning meeting that we conducted in July and that has been shown quite a bit on community TV and we are um, in the process of putting that onto our website. So. We will be following the same procedure again. It will be airing on TV, and then we hope to post this one again on our website soon. Do you want copies? Oh, awesome. Um, Drew also just whispered that um, if anybody does want a copy of this, they can get it through community TV or through me. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do they search on community TV? For this? Probably the event itself. So it'd be like recycled tag water taglines, yeah. So like the what this event is titled. Which I'm sorry, I'm lacking the knowledge of that right now. <laughs> so the question was asked, what do you search for um, when you go on the community TV website um, to look for the program once it's being aired? Um, Drew said that you can type in a tagline. It says um, recycled water or SCWD squared, and you should be able to see it. Also, when I was looking for the history of water planning uh, show. It was showing on channel 27, I think. Um, it shows both on Comcast and on 
um, charter. And if I do get that information, I will put that in the next email broadcast. So let me grab some of the questions. Do you guys all have microphones? So the first question is for Mr. McNeish. How did the recycled water transmission line, I'm sorry, how much did the recycled water transmission line cost to install? <clears throat> and what would it cost to retrofit the remainder of your community? lines that we just constructed in 2009 cost roughly $700,000. And uh, let me see how many miles that was. That was about, I'm going to guess, a, a mile and a half or so of transmission line. The project, the entire project that I've shown you, our capital cost for that on that slide was $8 million. Roughly $2 million of that was Two and a half million dollars was cost at the treatment plant. So the other five and a half million was for those other transmission lines. And uh, to give you too much detail, more than you want to know, the transmission line in Mount Hermon <coughs> Road is an old Schedule 40 PVC line that was donated to the district by the city. It used to convey the wastewater, the secondary effluent from the treatment plant during the land disposal phase. So it was used for that purpose at that time and it has now been reused as the transmission line uh, for the tertiary water. Ultimately, before too long, that line is going to have to be replaced. And I have one more thing. The entire cost of the project we expect to be $13 million uh, uh, when it's built out to provide the 370 million, uh, 370 acre feet build out capacity of the project. Thank you. This is a question probably for Laura or Bill. Laura or Bill? I just want to make sure you hear me. I'm trying to do my what is the source of income to the water district and the city in drought years when there is insufficient water to meet demand? The only source, is that working? Am I getting, I guess I am. I'll hold it close to my mouth. Uh, the only source of income for SoCal Creek Water District at any time is uh, revenue from our water fees and charges. So. Uh, unless we get grant money, we do not receive any tax revenue. Uh, so all of our income is a bi-monthly service charge on the water bill, and then a quantity charge for the actual amount of water sold. And then we have uh, fees for new services coming on to the district. In a drought, the impact would be the, on the quantity rate, the amount of water sold, we would lose revenue equivalent to the amount of reduced consumption in our customers. And we're on a tiered system, so if you're always a low water use customer, uh, less than, check me wrong, is it 20, about 20, 20 units, you have a, a kind of a base quantity rate. Then if you're into that next tier, up to 30 units, it's a higher rate. And if you're in the high tier, it's a really high rate. So you probably, in a drought, as the more discretionary water use is cut back, you'd see your revenue losses in those upper tiers. I really can't add too much to that. I think Santa Cruz is exactly the same, exactly the same situation. The, the one possible difference in the city is that the city council, after the uh, late 80s, early 90s drought, 
established a what they call a rate stabilization fund where they actually set aside monies so that in a drought when revenues drop you wouldn't have to go back to customers and, and ask them for a higher water rate in order to meet expenses. Um, but other, otherwise, I think it's just what Laura said. This question is um, aimed to Dr. Dave Smith. And this is one that I had asked you when we first met. Why is desalination considered reuse under the Water Reuse Association? Um, and then there was a comment, seems more like double speak. I don't think I said that, but that was it's on here. <laughs> Desalination is uh, part of the Water Reuse Association's portfolio because um, it is considered uh, an impaired uh, water from a water quality standpoint relative to uh, typical uses in water like irrigation or drinking or something like that. So seawater is something that we take an interest in, uh, saline groundwater, uh, wastewater, uh, any source of water that uh, needs some level of treatment to make it suitable for uh, reuse or use uh, is uh, something that we're uh, advocates for, where it makes sense. This question is um, probably for Mary and for Bill. One challenge we've had getting recycled water to North County irrigated ag lands is getting state parks on board. And I think this is in reference to Todd's uh, slide. Do you have any insight or suggestions based on your experience for more effective and persuasive communication and collaboration with farmers and how your um, experience with the ag farmers in South County could apply to North County? Mm -hmm. um, for, well, for us, for the Paro Valley, the coastal farmers were impacted with seawater intrusion, so they had a they 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 were very cognizant of the need to have a supplemental reliable supply, and then of course cost is a big component of that. And for for uh, agriculture, desalination is infeasible because the costs are too high. So there are those two issues that uh, we dealt with. A lot of the farmers on the north coast also farm down in the Pajaro Valley. And so most of the larger farmers on the north coast are fine with it. St. Parks is doing a, quite a campaign to, to encourage more organic farms on the north coast. And many of the organic, I, I'm exaggerating, uh, several of the organic farmers on the north coast lobbied state parks that they would rather not use reclaim. You can use reclaim uh, and still produce organic crops, but several of the farmers, and I was copied with the letter, so I know they did indeed lobby state parks to resist this, um, believed that because you have to post it on the, on the, when you sell your crops, you have to post it, that it was irrigated with reclaim. And they believed that that put them at a disadvantage in the marketplace. Um, at least that, that was their contention. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. The big problem, though, really wasn't the opposition of the growers. The big problem was the fact that um, it, it didn't produce enough groundwater. Or, yeah, it didn't produce. We couldn't produce enough water to last more than one year. So in a two-year drought, we wouldn't have a backup supply. Or at least that's what it appeared from investigations that had been done. There weren't a lot of wells put down for test pumping, but it appeared it was woefully short of meeting what the city would need in a two-year drought. That was really the biggest problem. But it was sort of the icing on the cake when State Parks wrote us a letter and said, we are the overlying land user. These farmers are renting from us. We own the land. And state law says if you own the land, you own the groundwater under it. And so they said, we consider that to be a state resource and we're not in the market to be uh, selling state resources. So that kind of, the combination of those two factors um, made that uh, not terribly attractive uh, project to proceed with. The other problem that we had with that project was that it was a higher energy use than DSAP. And the reason for that 
was sort of unique, I think, to that particular situation. If we were going to lay claim to the groundwater, we would need to keep everybody off of it so that it would be there in drought situations. And so in order to keep everybody off of that groundwater, we would need to produce reclaimed water every year. And desal, for us anyway, would be produced every year. And so when you look at the annual use of reclaim and the energy used for that, as opposed to a one in six or seven use of desal, it was actually a higher energy user. So there wasn't too much about that project that made it more attractive. Thank you. This one's for Mr. McNeish. Does the Scotts Valley Recycled Water System have excess capacity? And at what percentage are you operating at right now? The ultimate capacity, so the ultimate capacity of the plant, uh, with, with full utilization, we figure we'll be using 370 acre feet per year. Maybe a different way of saying that. Uh, during summer, there's 0.6 to 0.7 million gallons per day of sewer effluent that goes into the Scotts Valley treatment plant. That's the maximum capacity on a daily basis, obviously, that can be recycled and reused. So if we were to, during the peak summer months when irrigation demand is available, uh, we could generate 370 acre feet of, you know, at, at that capacity. So right now at 166, we're roughly 35% of the way there. This is a question probably for Bill. Um, in Todd's presentation, it was stated that the drought need was potable water. For the five drought stages that the city has planned for, which stage would only allow potable water use? No golf course, no out outdoor landscaping use. Uh, that would be the fifth stage, uh, which would be 50% or greater. But even in stage three, uh, golf courses would be uh, would be restricted by, I believe, 60%. So they could only use 40% of their average use, which is one of the things that's motivating the Post Temple Golf Course to talk very seriously with uh, Mr. Kamnish's agency. But uh, it, it, you would have to get into a very, very, very serious drought stage where all outdoor use would be prohibited. But I think it is, it, it's a safe thing to say that, for instance, if you had an event where you needed 25% um, curtailment. Outdoor watering in most residences would would cease. So uh, I, I think it is it's a safe thing to say that uh, you have to discount the value of reclaim if you're counting if an agency is counting on that in drought. This is a question that could probably be answered by Dr. Smith or the two general managers who have um, recycled water projects already online. What are some funding ideas? Um, what kind of sources are in place now? Um, what, if you also know of any funding ideas that could be used for the desal project? Well, I can talk in general and maybe um, the, the general managers can talk about uh, some specific opportunities that they're pursuing. But um, the funding opportunities, outside funding opportunities, are generally getting more and more difficult to obtain. Um, and more and more utilities are going to have to uh, finance these uh, projects with bonds that are paid for uh, with the, according to the, the rates uh, that their customers pay. Um, federal grants uh, are, are going to be going away um, for the most part. Um, there's still some there, but the uh, current budget climate in Washington, D.C., as Charles probably heard when we were there last week, um, is just not one we can count on long term. And so uh, there are low interest loan programs that the state operates with federal funds. Those are going to be harder to come by. Um, so more and more project financing is going to have to be done locally. Stop there and let some of the others describe their solutions that they're working on. Dr. 
not sure I can describe a solution. I can describe the approach. Um, as Dr. Smith said, a lot of the, both the federal and the state funding for these types of projects is going away because of the greater budget crises that are being faced at both the state and the federal level. Um, there is currently a Prop 50 water bond that uh, has put most of the money into approaches that are integrated regional water management approaches. Um, this area has been very successful in forming a collaborative. Uh, John, I think we have, what, seven to nine, nine partner agencies in our IOWM? We have nine. Nine partner agencies, including the city and Soquel Creek. And we're pooling our resources to go after those uh, funding opportunities that are for uh, regional programs. So the beauty of our project is that it's definitely a regional project that is attractive uh, if the money were there to fund it. There was discussion about a new water bond on uh, the November ballot that was dropped. Um, they felt that the state, uh, the voters would not support additional money uh, during this economic times. So we don't know yet when there may be another water bond and if it's approved by the voters and if we can uh, be successful in obtaining some of that money. Uh, so far, the desalination uh, studies and evaluations have gone on have been supported by, is it $2 million of state money for the pilot? $2 million grant from the state for the pilot study and another 600000 I believe, under the integrated regional grant that was uh, awarded to North Santa Cruz County. 600000 of that uh, is for the intake studies that are being done uh, for the pilot, for the uh, desal plant. Uh, whether we can get money for the actual capital construction of the plant it's just uh, too early to tell. We are actively pursuing all the sources and watching, uh, actively watching what grant money is out there and what uh, programs we might qualify for. Thank you. This one has two questions. If the goal is to enable the groundwater basin underlying Soquel Creek Water District to recover, how does the, the success of the Pajaro Valley um, reclamation project affect Soquel Creek Water District since it shares some of the same Aromas Red Sands Formation Aquifer. And the second question of that would be, and could a package reclamation project in the seascape area benefit both water districts? In terms of the first question, and Mary, if you have more information, let me know, but one of the uh, somewhat mysteries right now is how much of an influence uh, the pumping of the Pajaro Valley is having on the Aromas portion, which is about a third of the Soquel District, uh, beginning at about uh, Aptos Creek down through the end of our district, which is La Selva Beach, is where we do share the aquifer that then extends on into the Pajaro Valley. Um, we are having uh, groundwater overdraft in that area. How much of it is being influenced by the Pajaro Valley situation, we do not know. Uh, the USGS is preparing a groundwater model that extends up through the entire basin that will hopefully give us a better understanding of the uh, hydrology and how it's interacting in that area. Um, in terms of the direct benefits, I don't think there's enough data and understanding of the system at this point to be able to quantify what kind of direct benefit uh, the Soquel area or you know, that portion of our district might receive from the usage of reclaimed water in the Pajaro Valley. In the big picture, I think the 4,000 acre feet, while it's significant and certainly valuable, is not a huge impact in terms of the overall groundwater overdraft in the valley, which you quantified about 20,000, 20,000 feet, so you're only a fifth of dealing with the problem. So the repercussion effects of that up north are probably not going to be too significant. Also, because I believe the coastal distribution system is centered more uh, down the valley, and there isn't uh, an extension of that 
system to the growers that are adjacent to Soquel. Um, the second question, remind me again. A collaborative project in the seascape area, could that benefit both agencies? Um, in terms of the ability for reclaimed water in the seascape area, seascape area, the first thing is I think that uh, production agriculture would have uh, use all of the water that the Watsonville wastewater treatment plant could produce. In fact, I think currently you're using 100% of the summer demand. Not quite, but, but we'll there isn't a surplus there. So from that source of water going through that plant, there isn't any surplus that you could ship up to Seascape. The project that Todd discussed was using the sewer uh, water right in the seascape area to irrigate the golf course. We also looked at could we irrigate some of the other uses in that area. The problem is is that we are we have woefully little wastewater. I, I guess that's an interesting problem that you have too little sewage, but we don't have enough even to meet the golf course needs. Uh, as Todd's chart showed, it's a very small quantity. So even if we were to put in a satellite reclamation plan for the golf course, they would still need to maintain their own groundwater wells to ultimately make their full demand. These last two that uh, deal with the recycled water, Dr. Smith, this one says, does recycled water filtration systems reduce or take out pharmaceuticals, or will there still be some leftover after treatment? Each step in the treatment process, uh, from primary to secondary on through, removes some of these pharmaceuticals. There are a few that even make it through reverse osmosis. Um, and to deal with those that make it through a reverse osmosis membrane, uh, as Todd described, there's what's called advanced oxidation. And that is a high energy ultraviolet um, radiation. Uh, and then uh, peroxide treatment, so two strong oxidants uh, take care of and denature those uh, pharmaceuticals so that they're uh, um, harmless at that point. Great, thank you. And this final question we'll ask before we um, close the meeting goes to Ms. Bannister and Mr. McNeish. In summary, how would you describe how Pajaro Valley handled the needed pipes? and also Scotts Valley. How were you able to put the pipes in um, and overcome the challenges that are being faced by the city and the district? Um, and the second part of that is, um, is the recycled water stored somewhere for later use when not needed, since both of you have discussed extra usage um, during winter times? Uh, I'll take the first stab at that because I'm um, our reason, we don't have much storage at the plant. We have a couple million acre, uh, million gallons worth of storage, and uh, a million gallons is about three acre feet. And our daily demand can be upward of, of 15 acre feet, 20 acre feet a day. So we don't even have half of a day's storage on, on site. So that is a challenge for us right now: is, is to identify as we move forward um, additional storage. What was the other Oh, how did we get the pipes in the ground? How did we overcome those challenges? Well, as I mentioned, I think for us, it was not as challenging as it would be for some of the more um, urban uh, users because we are largely agricultural in the area where the pipes were put in. Um, we bored and jacked or micro-tunneled underneath Highway 1 and Beach Road, but everywhere else we were dealing with unpaved uh, agricultural fields. So getting in there and getting the pipes in required very close cooperation with the growers and in some cases taking crops out or not planting strips and, and dealing with those kinds of issues, but nothing to the extent of having to go through paved neighborhoods like some of these other um, concepts would require. In Scotts Valley, I wasn't in Scotts Valley at the time. It's my understanding though that the reason why the investment was made was because the water situation was perceived as sufficiently grave and alarming that that investment needed to be made, uh, and it was. Uh, you know, it, it was fortunate that one of the main distribution lines was in place and could be reused, but the other construction 
money had to be assembled and used and invested. Um, uh, as Mary says, well, we don't have any storage. We've got daily storage in our tank. I showed you on the slide. Recycled water tank. That holds one day's quantity of recycled water. So we're filling that up every night when we're using it. Uh, there's no present ability to store the water that's produced during the winter and reuse it during the summer. We don't really have a location to do that. You know, it would be ideal if we could store it underground. There are many, many portable wells in that area meeting the residency requirements and uh, all of the issues that uh, Dr. Smith talked about would be extremely challenging. But we're certainly looking at that in the future. Thank you. So I just wanted to thank the panelists tonight and the uh, speakers for presenting. So if we could give one more round of applause. And I also want to thank the audience tonight. Thank you very much for coming and taking time out of your busy schedule. I just wanted to close with this. As I was coming to the meeting tonight, I was talking to a friend on the phone and I said, I've got to go, I'm going to a meeting on recycled water. And she said, oh, what's recycled water? And I was like, well, you're kidding, right? And she's like, no, I, I don't know. And it just kind of, it's giving me goosebumps right now just talking about it that I really appreciate that you came tonight and that there's a community out there that wants to learn about this subject and other subjects related to water. And I encourage you to please come to the community meetings that we'll be holding um, in the future. Our next one is on November 10th. It's going to be at Loudon Nelson Center, and it will talk about the marine issues related to desalination. So thank you, guys. <laughs>